Hi, welcome to our next BRI Scholars Talk about our forthcoming U.S. history textbook, Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness. I am Tony Williams, a senior fellow with the Institute, and it is my great honor to be speaking to Amity Schlaes today. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, Amity. I'm glad to be here. Excellent. Uh, I'm gonna, I'll introduce you now. Amity Schlaes is the prize-winning and best-selling, New York Times best-selling author of uh, four books, among many others she's written, including The Forgotten Man, A New History of the Great Depression, Coolidge, and most recently, The Great Society, A New History. And I read these all, Amity. They are really great books. Uh, she regularly contributes to numerous publications, including the Wall Street Journal. Uh, she chairs the board of the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Foundation, a national foundation based in the birthplace of President Coolidge. The foundation's goal is to share Coolidge with Americans by hosting high school debate and events at the Coolidge site and through newer media. She is currently a presidential scholar at the King's College and the chairman of the Hayek Prize. Again, thank you very much for joining us. Glad to be here. Okay, so well, uh, you wrote an essay uh, on Calvin Coolidge uh, for Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness. And you wrote that Coolidge demonstrated a number of virtues uh, early on that carried through the course of his life. Uh, and among these were, were perseverance and humility. And so my first question is going to be, how did these virtues shape the course of his life? And, and how was his character shaped by family, uh, community, by his education? These virtues shape not only the course of Coolidge's life, but also the course of America's life, political and cultural. So they're very important. Thank you for asking that. Uh, as a young man, Coolidge, uh, as a child even, Coolidge learned in Plymouth Notch, Vermont, and at the Coolidge Foundation, we invite kids to come there and adults to see what it was like. Imagine a, a farm town that has a tight community and does all right, but does not become rich and has to work for every meal one way or the other. So life starts with getting sugar in the spring from the maple trees when it's still cold and carrying a yoke like an ox with two heavy sugar buckets on it going to the summer and um, through haying and tanning and shoeing horses into the fall, uh, uh, slaughtering animals, uh, it, it, so the work scarcely stopped. He he saw that and he observed the tenacity of the citizens of Plymouth. His father was sort of um, jack of all trades and master of all as well, John Coolidge. Uh, he was sheriff at times. He was a representative in the state capitol in Montpelier at times. Remember, Vermont is tiny. He was uh, the bailiff at times. He definitely collected taxes, such as the snow tax for uh, packing down snow so you could ride across snow in your sleigh. It was that period. You remember it's dark, kind of like Ethan Fromm, if anyone's ever read that, uh, about four o'clock or five o'clock and there's no electricity. It's very hard to wash dishes when it's very cold and there's no electricity, needless to say, dishwasher. Have you ever tried to get a dish ungreasy with cold water. You can imagine what life must have been like for people who had to clean plates in this scenario, which would be both genders. Uh, and he, he saw that. He was definitely, his father was up there in the town. So he was definitely not the poorest child in the town, but he was not by any stretch wealthy. And he, he observed all that. And he observed, and it's, as he says beautifully in his autobiography, that people had good times and bad times and were not particularly um, going to rejoice in or complain about either. That was just how life was in Plymouth. Plymouth's very American. It's not foreign to most Americans because Plymouth is where we migrated from, many of us. 
So imagine people landing on the East Coast and then going to the Midwest. There are plenty of people with the name Coolidge in the Midwest and in the Plains, Minnesota. So uh, if you say, I'm a Texan and I have nothing to do with Coolidge, that's not true. There are plenty of people from Vermont in Texas, if you go all the way back. Vermont was a, a way station for such families, wherever they came from. So all that affected his adulthood, particularly the perseverance part. Um, that I, I, I think it's important to know too, that they were, were in COVID era, quite accustomed to death. Uh, and uh, un, as we are not, and expected people to die, as we do not. And he had some bitter experiences. He lost his mother when he was a boy. He lost his sister, Abby, of whom he was very fond. She was the more boisterous extrovert of the pair. She wanted to be a teacher. And at that age, in that era, if you can imagine, you could qualify as a teacher at 14 or 15 years old. Uh, they went to the little school and then they went to boarding school uh, nearby because your mom couldn't drive you 10 miles to school. That was too far with a sleigh or a wagon. And th so they boarded in uh, Ludlow, Vermont, which is um, for a reference point for modern people by uh, the home of the ski resort, Okimo, which is well known uh, to New Yorkers because you can go straight up from New York. So, so it's a different time. Um, he missed his mother in boarding school. He was lonely. He went to college. He was lonely. Um, he was a, uh, he, I wouldn't say he was a man of um, outspoken piety. That is, he didn't say, I am walking with God every morning or dare to walk with God, but he was steeped in piety. His grandmother um, taught Sunday school. They lived a a life of faith. Um, everything in their lives had to do with faith, even the cake recipes, because they had a cake recipe, um, which I mentioned in the Coolidge book, which uh, in which each ingredient comes from a passage in the Old Testament, and maybe New Testament too, but it comes from a passage in the Bible. That's the kind of life he had. And as an adult, he acknowledged the importance of faith in all he did. So the second part of the question, should I answer? How did that affect his politics? Uh, or just, you know, the, his, his public service in general. Uh, he understood that there were things in the world more important than he was. Okay. He had a sanctimony. None of us is flawless, right? right? He had a sanctimony. There's such a thing as narcissistic sanctimony. I will virtue signal my way to the grave because uh, I am wonderful. And I'm pretending to be good, but I'm also pandering to my own vanity. I am elect. I'm a Protestant. My name is Calvin, right? He had a sanctimony, but I don't think it was heavily self-centered. He really understood that, in his case, he really understood that there was plenty of things in the world more important than he, which is rare nowadays. And that his experience uh, mattered less than what he offered. And that's also a great relief, by the way. If you're in a life of service, you don't have to worry about whether you're happy. Very, very important. You have to worry about what you do for others. He's one of those people, there's no limit to what you can achieve also if you don't care who gets the credit. I'm gonna name three points in his life where this was evident and for the good of the country, he, he sacrificed self uh, to country. One was during the Boston police strike he liked the policemen. They went on strike. By the way, they were key constituents for him politically. He was governor and he had an election within a few months when the Boston police went on strike. Coolidge was famous for getting the Irish vote. What were the policemen? They were Irish. If he hurt the striking policemen, they would not vote for him and he would not be governor again. Simple as that. And he wrote so it's basically just about as much to his father, his confident, as important father, um, and yet he did the right thing in his view, and I believe in my own, he fired the policemen for striking because they were breaking their contract, which said you cannot strike. They've signed it. It's a very tough call, very controversial call. Um, so you have to wonder what he would say about policemen uh, having uh, sick outs today when they're unhappy with what's going on in their town. Coolidge might be on the same side as protesters because police need to serve. 
this has been pointed out to me by people who want to argue um, shows Coolidge's flexibility. Um, a second instance would be the, um, I'm just trying to think, when he chose not to run for president in 1927. You get used to people liking you and being the center of attention. We all do. And then we look for love the rest of our lives and affirmation that we are the wonderful people we think we are. So it's very hard to give up the White House or any political office. And Coolidge, it's hard to recall, but uh, it, he had been elected once in 1924, so he could be elected again in 1928 or even more in those days, but sort of culturally, no one would be offended by someone who had only been elected once going a second time, even though just before he was elected on his own for the first time, he'd become president due to the tragic death of Warren Harding. Anyway, he had every right to run again in his period, but he chose not to and said in his autobiography, uh, uh, forgive me for the paraphrase, um, American presidents are surrounded by yes men. That means they're not necessarily so awesome in their decisions after a time because no one challenges them. And also people, there's a political cycle in America and people, presidents lose what, um, what President Bush, 43, always talked about his political capital. That is faith with the voters. Second terms aren't very effective for the party the president represents often. They can be tragically ineffective. And he said, well, it's healthy for America to change people in, in the chief office, in the office of the president. So he was closer to the notion of president as presider, um, like George Washington, whom he honored deeply, not as commander in chief at home, which isn't exactly what our constitution calls for, but many Americans currently accept. And when he chose not to run, he was very hurt because nobody said, bravo, Calvin Coolidge, man of probity, everyone should be like him. The Republican Party was furious at him because he had long coattails, as they say. A lot of other people would get elected if he got elected. And he was hurting the party by not running when he was popular. So he had a terrible purgatory a period after he announced he would not run in 2028 20, out of character reasons. Um, and he wasn't getting any praise for it, right? which is kind of unexpected, right? It's normal to think. And he really didn't have much say, none of us does, about who would be his successor. His successor was Herbert Hoover. Coolidge didn't like Herbert Hoover. He was a different kind of man, not like me, right? Herbert Hoover filled the room with his energy. He was very bossy and he was definitely a jump in crisis leader. So imagine the discomfort of Coolidge doing the right thing and not getting much praise for it. And being lonely, by the way, and going into the abyss of the post-presidency, that was an extreme example of overcoming personal need, desire, want for the nation and for character. Excellent. Uh, so a lot of humility there, I think. Um, so what was his uh, view, the role of the very expansive uh, changes in the role of the federal government, uh, particularly you know, with the progressive era and the expansion of the state in World War One, you know, what was his, what, what were his views of a lot of those changes going on in American society and particularly in government? Well, that, that gets me to the third thing, which I forgot in the last question, oh, so that's good. Um, Coolidge was not a grown-up progressive. He was a governor progressive, mm -hmm. which may be a governor grown-up, but as a president, he was you know, in his maturity, he was not a progressive. And he had a lot of, you know, hesitations about progressive progress. So while governor, while still a nominal progressive, because recall that the Republicans were the progressives at that time, by and large, um, he kind of supported progressive efforts. You don't hear a speech by him saying, there should be no federal reserve from 1912 or 1913, you don't hear him say, we need to get rid of um, this commission or that agency that's a product of the progressive wave. Well, um, these institutions, you know, there are a lot of commissions at that period, which were the, the expression of progressivism. You don't really hear that um, when he's a governor. And once in a while, he'll support uh, a progressive bit of legislation as a governor. But when he becomes president, 
for whatever reason. Um, I think because he thinks progressivism is okay for states, but not for Washington, right? It's one thing to be a state progressive. Um, he gets a little more opinionated and louder, and he wrote a speech called The Limitations of the Law, which I think it was when he gave his vice president that it's wonderful, um, and then a few others. Um, he did not believe the federal government could do everything and that every wrong could be righted by the federal government or perhaps even the states. Um, so that's very clear, very much there. Very concerned that the progressive wave is building to a irre irreversible and totally destructive tsunami. Um, it didn't like the progressives in his party particularly, but didn't, didn't speak up because he was a party man on individuals too much. Um, and uh, if you look at what he did that, that was deeply conservative and important and often left out by social historians is Coolidge signaled that the tax rate must always be downward. And we can't tell you what the rate's gonna be, but too much taking by government is legalized larceny, he said, or some other similar term he also used. And he he really didn't like um, the government to have too much money. Uh, and along came Andrew Mellon, the Treasury Secretary, in some ways senior to his own president. It was said of Mellon, the great Treasury Secretary, that three presidents served under him because he was such a mighty, sort of like having Warren Buffett plus I don't know, um, Elon Musk plus Jeff Bezos, all in one man in the treasury and the poor little president comes along and, you know, um, he didn't agree with everything that Mellon wanted, but he did want less government in the way of people. And Mellon had this idea that if you cut the tax rate, the government will get more money. <sighs> Coolidge was torn about that because he wanted the government to balance the budget it did, but he didn't want the government to get more money because then Congress might spend it, mm. get bigger, right? So he's very torn, and this is an example of character, the third example. But Coolidge went along with this hokey theory that if you cut the tax rate, you get more revenue than you expect, at least by the math, because he believed in the principle of delegation. And he knew that Mellon was better than he was at finance. And therefore, if Mellon said, we must do this, Coolidge was his servant as president, not the other way. And he gave speeches in which he was very uncomfortable. You can see that there are a few tapes of Coolidge and one, one um, tax act um, not too satisfying was passed in 24. And Coolidge gave a speech about around then and he gave speeches later. He wanted another uh, tax cut for Mellon. Uh, but you can see the deep discomfort in him what if Mellon backfires and we don't get the money and our deficit widens Hars, or, or appears and widens? What if we succeed too well, we get too much money? Hars, <laughs> then Congress will spend it. And uh, you can feel almost the physical tension of his anxiety over backing Mellon. Yet he did. Sometimes you have to back your deputy. That is wonderful. Uh, and of course, when there's less money to spend, progressives have less money and there's less political ambition for progressive projects. So he was like a person, a boy with his finger in the dike and on the other side of the dike was the pressing the great ocean of the progressive movement and he was able to hold the water, water back in the 1920s. We might have had a progressive ocean tsunami a decade earlier had we not had Coolidge. Okay, great. So, so that's the views of progressivism, and you you, t you touched on, teased out a little bit of his political and economic philosophy. But can you can you explore that a little bit more? What what were the some of the central tenets or central ideas of his political and, and economic outlook? Um, men do not make laws; they do but discover them. There are a few laws underneath it all to come from. Uh, from God or from, but ma I mean, mainly are things of the spirit. Uh, so what we are doing as lawmakers is 
making explicit something we already knew. That's very different conception from modern uh, lawmaking, where we are architects of the law, architects of the Constitution. We architects of the con he he had a great respect for the framers and for the principle that you don't elaborate too much in law either. If you write in a law that the nurse every two hours must dip her hands four times in antiseptic um, and six times when she's working with old, old people, and that's in the law, the nurse gets knows she must save the old people from COVID, but she's pretty darn irritated because she's breaking the law all the time. Once in a while, she only gets to dip her hands three times. And once in a while, you know, that is the more prescriptive a law and the more detailed, the more there is the possibility of, of breaking the law, even inadvertently. He believed that the best laws were laws you could, um, you, you, could, you could manage not to violate. You can see a tension with prohibition in that regard. For example, this is the period when hard liquor was illegal, basically. And that's almost impossible to enforce. And when he saw that that eroded the rule of law itself, having a law that was impossible to enforce, and it graded on him. So simple few laws, some uh, inspired from above, and um, that uh, civilization doesn't make ideals. We don't make it ideals in a meeting. Ideals make civilization. He said, um, I'm giving you all these legal and sort of government rules because they're so wonderful. Um, don't expect to help the weak by pulling down the strong. Okay. Ooh, we, no leveling. It doesn't even help the weak. That's important to us. Uh, give administration a chance to catch up with legislation. Yeah. Lawmakers want to justify their existence by passing a law. Otherwise, they're losers, right? And won't get reelected every two years if they're congressmen or every four years or every six years, right? Um, but in reality, administration needs to learn the new law before we can gauge whether that law is effective. So he, he knew that. Better to kill a bad law than pass or sign a good one. He wrote that to his father in Montpelier. It goes on like that. It's astonishing to me that we didn't learn more about him in school because he has a um, very a churchy way of writing. He's heard a lot of sermons and his speeches are as clear as a good sermon, most of them. And that's rare in a president. He by and large, wrote his own speeches. His best speech was written uh, even before he was governor. It's called Have Faith in Massachusetts. And at the Coolidge Foundation, um, we, uh, whenever we can, and sometimes as part of the curriculum, have kids recite that speech in Coolidge's church. The church is non-denominational, not particularly religious anymore, but it's a serious place. And to be in that building, that is, we have secular events in the church. Um, it makes the kids stand up and the grown-ups stand up and we try to have good diction, have faith in Massachusetts, just the length of a good sermon, a few minutes, not 25, certainly not 20. So, so um, I think he, it, 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 he's someone who can be read and recited over and over again. And that's what we emphasize at the Coolidge Foundation now with thousands of kids, very like the Bill of Rights Institute, by the way. Good. Uh and uh, so World War I erupts, uh, 1914, America gets involved in 1917, and then of course the, the war ends and, and America is considering the, the Versailles Treaty under the Wilson administration. And so it's, it's really uh, causing great changes in the world and America's role in, role in the world. Uh, what, what were some of Coolidge's views of these uh, larger and important events? Well, Coolidge was, first and foremost, a domestic politician. Mm -hmm. That did not mean, however, that he didn't have a foreign policy. His policy was that America must lead by example, not by intervention. Mm -hmm. City on a hill. Right. The model of America is as important as its guns or soldiers, right? Send it it, you know, there was gunboat diplomacy and he was involved in it, including, for example, in Nicaragua. Um, but that wasn't, that, these were more inherited efforts and responsibilities. Uh, he was mainly a city on a hill person. The Republican Party was against the League of Nations, led by nations, led by Henry Cabot 
Lodge, there were some compromises, such as the so-called World Court. Um, Coolidge was okay with that. He couldn't always get them through. He did um, want to do something symbolic. Again, America as leading by example. So he allowed his foreign secretary, his secretary of state, or maybe secretary of war, I can't recall what it was called, but anyway, Frank Kellogg to um, get together the kellogg Briand Pact, which outlawed war and is always mocked. I'm not sure it should be mocked, by the way. Uh, um, anyone who mocks it too fast, any teacher, don't let him intimidate you into mocking along with him before you do your own independent analysis of the kellogg Brian back but he said basically it to to kellogg is it unconstitutional does it give away too much american sovereignty to sign a pact agreeing to end war no one did it he thought it was very important symbolically so we signed it um he also did in terms of foreign policy he with mellon worked on the refinancing of the debt of european nations throughout the 20 students have heard of the dawes plan and the young plan Tragically, that wasn't enough. Um, there's one area of foreign policy where he really screwed up, but to his, uh, by way of explanation, um, though not excuse, so did his entire party. The Republican Party was for tariffs, and tariffs hurt foreign countries. And if on the one hand you lower interest rates for foreign countries, but on the other you preclude them from selling you goods, you, you are sending a mixed message to be polite um, to them about your respect for them in the world and we did hurt germany by routinely i don't know randomly imposing uh tariffs worldwide um and germany uh turned against the world uh, uh um we also hurt cuba and if you're ever debating and really want to get calvin coolidge and hate his guts i think the strongest argument is that he and it's a stretch but you could certainly do that in high school or college um was he increased or permitted the increase of tariffs on sugar from Cuba. Well, sugar is really important to Cuba. It's about all they exported. So what, what are we doing to Cuba when we do that? Um, in order to help what? Maple syrup and American sugar, right? So he did that. And I think a real stretch of a paper, but a fun one would be to argue that Coolidge caused the rise of communism in Cuba. I always want to write that one. I never got around to it. There's an effective doubling of sugar tariffs in the 20s. The data are there in NBER pages or history books. Okay, so uh, moving forward into the 1920s and, and during the time in which he's president, many scholars uh, really talk about the idea of a, a return to normalcy in which the Republicans created an era of excess sandwiched between kind of the more reformist movements of the progressive era and and then the new deal you know how does how does the coolidge presidency contribute uh to that idea of, of limited government uh, against those those two movements uh, that, that but and yet promoting a, a dynamic economic growth and a vibrant civil society you know how do you have a, a vibrant america and yet still have limited government that's it's not yet or it's limited government creates a vibrant america okay. there's no conflict right. there's no such thing as excess in the private sector because the it self-corrects if a company makes too many cars the cars do not sell the company ceases to make too many cars it loses money its shareholders lose money its employees get laid off because it made an error the the only excess that so there's nothing wrong with domestic private wealth excess there's something that that can't be corrected by reality government if you rate if you if you buy your children too many Prada purses your children will be spoiled pigs and you will pay for it and they will pay for it little girls with Prada purses, little, right? If you buy your son too many rifles, they bought, you know, and so on. It, 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 you know, there's a cost to behavior in the private sector that means almost always excess is ephemeral and disappears. Government excess is permanent and damaging to all. So he pulled the government back 
so that the private sector might do better. It did better. The 20s really did roar. Um, that was wonderful. What did we get? And you decide if it's excessive. That, what what do we get? They were particularly what we call you know, productivity gains. That is, you could make as many more, more uh, objects in an hour, cars, than you could uh, formerly because of the assembly line, because of electricity, because of all these new things coming online. The internet of the 20s was electricity. You could plug in a vacuum cleaner for the first time. Um, what did you get out of that? Did you get a feeling you were being excessive? No, you got Saturday off. Because in five days, men could make, or women, what they had formerly made in six. Oh, what do you do with that Saturday? So is that a problem? You know, uh, you, you do something very important to you. You do something for your community. You, or you lie around, that's, that's your discretion. But, but there's, I think most people would agree that it's better we have five days of work than six. We got indoor plumbing from the excesses of the 20s. That uh, indoor, if there's one thing that, if you want to define the difference between working poor and poverty, it's indoor plumbing. Uh, it, it, once you have plumbing, you are no longer really as out of it, as miserable, as unlikely to be healthy as you are without indoor plumbing. It, it's a real line moving towards the middle class, indoor plumbing. I mean, in other countries, of course, still, India, right? So the, the 20s were the area where, era where we got a radio, Saturday off, maybe a car, and indoor plumbing. I rest my case. They were an awesome decade with a lot of patents and a lot of uh, great minds going into the period. The argument that the stock market went too high, um, in my view, it did. There's an argument that it didn't, uh, written by Nobel Prize winners, by the way, though you'd never hear that. Look up Prescott, uh, P R E. S-C-O-T-T, -T, Edward or Ned Prescott. Um, but so the stock market went too high. In those days, the president was not in charge of the stock market. There was no Securities and Exchange Commission. Stocks were regulated locally and uh, by the states. And in Coolidge's experience, the stock market had crashed four or five times without any Great Depression. Um, so he himself thought it was kind of too high. You can see from his correspondence that he was looking for um, maybe crash-proof stocks. He thought maybe grocery chains might be a good investment because people shop even for food, even when uh, they, they forgo luxury goods. But, it, it, you know, there's not much you can blame on Coolidge or even on the 20s. A period of prosperity. A period of strong, exemplary prosperity that we would love to have today with low unemployment and Saturday. Right. <laughs> and so, uh, so Coolidge contributes to this uh, more restrained view of government, but he also contributes to a more restrained view, I think, of, of presidential power, uh, especially compared to maybe some of his predecessors like Teddy Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, uh, and then his successors like uh, Franklin Roosevelt, just, just to name one. Uh, so, so what was his view of presidential power? How, why did he want to restrain it more than, than the others? Well, he lived close to the Constitution, okay. as I think I might have mentioned. Um, president presider, not king. Why is it called president? Because he's supposed to preside, not play king. That, uh, that was very clear to him. Um, he was quite aware of the monarchs of Europe. Uh, so, so that's true. And I, I'm often asked, you know, there's a project at, I think, Mercatus, um, looking at executive orders because that would be an expression of executive um, ambition, right? The president makes whole laws with executive orders. Is that right? Is that constitutional? And, and those who quantify these executive orders, orders are always confounded because Coolidge is supposed to be a small government guy, signed a lot of executive orders. And what I'm waiting for, please, is the dissertation that analyzes Coolidge's executive orders. Because my impression perusing them he had 50 vetoes. He killed a lot of laws. Um, but my impression, uh, looking at his executive orders, is that they were very narrow in scope, such as this Native American land moves two inches to the right on the map, because even then Native American land was different and under the auspices of the federal government, you know, in some situations. Uh, or um, the... Uh, this very, very small executive order is not um, 
usually big ones, but that's only anecdotal. And I don't have all of them because all of them are not online or even easy to retrieve. They called them different names sometimes. They weren't called executive orders all the time in that period. And whoever writes that dissertation um, is going to make a great contribution because the executive orders of Coolidge are a mirror of his approach to federalism. His vetoes were beautiful and he worked very hard on his veto letters. He was sometimes overridden, particularly, uh, you know, the, the Republican Party is, remember, the progressives were in his own party. So he only represented some Republicans. Uh, other Republicans were way, way more progressive than he. But he generally, he vetoed um, veterans bonus because he thought that would set a precedent moving towards social security. He was prescient. Uh, he didn't always, uh, he vetoed farm subsidy, which is deeply unexpected by some because he was from a farming family. What do you farm in Vermont? How hard is farming there? You farm rocks in Vermont. <laughs> and, and someone said that farms don't lay, that, that was the humorous Will Rogers. In Vermont, they hang <laughs> because they're up, and so people thought he was our dairy. We say when we, you know, that is, it, dairy would be the most important um, lobby for someone from Vermont, but he was not at all uh, concerned with dairy. And there's a wonderful scene where some farming lobby people went to see him with him and Coolidge was a master of, of pauses. What he didn't say told the story as much as what he did. and. He's, so I'm going to try and replicate it without the accent. I want to inflict that on you. But it was like, they said, please give us agricultural money. Of course you understand why agriculture needs subsidy. Your father has a desperate little cheese factory, you know. Um, and he said, well, farmers never have made much money. <laughs> Pause. <laughs> Don't suppose they ever will. Pause. Pause. Don't suppose there's much we can do about it. He would out sit people in a room till they left too. He was very good, at, very familiar type uh, to those of us uh, who grew up around such people. And there are a lot of them in the United States in the olden days, fewer now, just don't say anything. Um, so I think that's enough about his principles, but if there's one you wanna to get to, I'm ready. <laughs> Well, uh, in thinking about uh, the expanded role of the federal government throughout time, which is something that um, students are, are asked to do uh, often in, in U.S. history classes, how did the presidency of Calvin Coolidge compare with some other presidencies that you've written about, particularly uh, a presidency like Franklin Roosevelt with his New Deal, Lyndon Johnson with his Great Society? How would you compare those, those 20th century presidencies? Well, he didn't lead with the heart because he thought that was weak and wrong. My heart feels Vermont is, my eye sees Vermont is flooded. The bridges I know are swept away. The lieutenant governor I know has drowned. Should I go to Vermont? No, I must not go to Vermont because I am president of the United States, not president of Vermont. If I go to Vermont, I will be showing favoritism to my home state. That would be wrong. A very moral argument. He can't do for his own what he didn't do for others, is what the way they paraphrased it in Vermont. Very upright. Nowadays, and so, so you think of Johnson particularly, uh, Johnson led with his heart. If I saw how poor people are in Texas and how much education they need when I pass an education bill. I'm gonna to run to Dex Texas and show Texas what I did because I love Texas and what my heart feels must be right. Coolidge, so then people um, who believe president should lead with the heart, whatever the result, thought Coolidge cold. But this is not, of course, just a presidency contest or evaluation. This happens to introverts like Coolidge all the time. People who speak less and who speak less heatedly or betray their own sentiments less don't have less heart. They're just set up differently. And sometimes they're more moral. Sometimes they're less moral. But anyway, they're different. In Coolidge's case, he had a lot of heart, but he was very moral and he didn't believe you should play favorites. 
he, he didn't even, he also didn't believe the charity from the federal government. I mean, I don't think he even could conceive of the scale of our entitlements, but charity from the federal, he, he didn't think the way to reward the veterans for their service was with a national pension because that would be social security for, for veterans and then everyone else. Cause he felt that, um, well, if we did that, we might run out of money and then someone else would lose out no matter how much we love the veterans. And one should serve the country, not for money, but for the honor of serving. Whoa. He said that today you'd be ridiculed out of the room. Nonetheless, there's a great component of truth to it. Right. Okay. Uh, can you tell us uh, more about the Coolidge Foundation? I, I know you work a lot with, with students as we do at the Bill of Rights Institute, and, and I'm sure our teachers and students and, and uh, other citizens who are listening and watching would, would love to hear more about what you do. Well, we have worked with the Bill of Rights Institute, and uh, your colleagues have been up to teach our students, um, the, and that's wonderful. Uh, I think it was your institute that gave out George Washington's um, letter on etiquette for young men. Is that correct? Maybe uh, a Ben you Franklin. Saw that? Yes. There's a Washington one and a Franklin one, and I can't remember. Um, so it, what we do is we do um, because what's important we believe is is civility. In order to learn, we need to be civil, and our, our education doesn't always give us both sides of arguments, particularly non economic and uh, US history arguments. So, we have a high school debate program that has served thousands now, um, where it, culminating in the Coolidge Cup, to which you can apply even if your school does not debate um, in Vermont, and we bring kids to Vermont, we pay the kids who make it to come to Vermont when you qualify you get a scholarship when possible excuse me um to Vermont uh to debate um and kids debate both sides of an issue we um are very concerned that kids know all the arguments for both sides so we do offer briefs from which they may argue we insist on topicality which is very important in debate because a lot of times in debate nowadays the debate will ramble off into other areas if we're debating um, the merits or demerits of the quarantine shutdown as we were now, we looked at the economic arguments for both sides and we insisted our debaters do the same and they did. We have a hot competition uh, and that's in beautiful Plymouth Notch in Vermont by the end where you get to see uh, the wonderful mountains of Vermont and the wonderful um, homestead of Coolidge. Uh, we also have a national scholarship contest, which is even more hotly contested this year. Um, we had 3,400 candidates for three scholarships. Mm -hmm. um, the 3,400 for three, uh, we have scholars who win the college, which is a full ride to any college for academic merit. We also have a senator's program for the top 100 kids who have won as well, uh, even to make it that four out of 3,400. It's harder to get the scholarship than to get into MIT. Um, so our senators um, learn about Coolidge in Washington. They learn about um, the history of federalism. They learn about government. They hear from both sides sides of the aisle politically but they but they learn with an emphasis on Coolidge values and they learn at Coolidge House which is in Washington in lovely Georgetown because uh, you want to get a feel for the architecture of our history when you're learning about our history so you can know what what rooms Coolidge might have moved in Georgian rooms as in the White House or colonial rooms as at the notch and also what rooms were moved in by or lived in by those he most admired well uh keep up the tremendous work on uh civics education and uh the scholarships for young people and and all the fine work you're doing and uh, we look forward to your your next book and uh, i want to thank you very much for your contributions to life liberty and the pursuit of happiness uh, and also for our conversation today well, thank you for supporting Calvin Coolidge. The Bill of Rights friends have done a lot of work on Coolidge. The more, the better. He's a wonderful president. Way underrated. Thank you.